All right, so get ready, folks, because today we're going deep. Deep. Into a world. A hidden world. That uh, most people yeah. never even see. Yeah, you got it. Rosettes Whoops. and pseudorosettes. Oh, yeah. In brain tumors and animals. It's a... Uh... It's a fascinating area and important too. Oh, absolutely. Especially for us vets. Yeah, and, and to help us navigate this microscopic landscape, we've got a fantastic review paper. Oh, great. It's a guy, yes. All right. It's called Rosettes and Pseudorosettes in Veterinary Neuropathology. Catchy. By uh, Rissy and Miller. All right, Rissy and Miller. From Veterinary Pathology. Great journal. So oh. the title really uh, lays it all out. It does. We're going to look at what these rosettes and pseudorosettes look like, yeah. how they form, and what they tell us about the tumors. It's like a little detective work. Absolutely. You know, we don't always have access to the same fancy tests they use in human medicine. Right. So these microscopic clues are really vital for us. Okay, so let's start with the basics. Okay. What exactly are we talking about when we say rosette? I bet you're picturing a tiny rose. <laughs> you're not far off. Kind of. Think of cells arranged in a circle. Okay. Like uh, like those beautiful rose windows you see in Gothic architecture. Or those stained glass windows? Yeah, exactly. Beautiful. The paper even has a diagram showing this in figure one. Nice. But, you know, things are changing a bit in the naming department. Oh, really? Scientists are moving away from naming things after people, you know, those eponyms. Right. And we're going for more descriptive names. I so, for example, what used to be called Homer Wright rosettes oh, okay. are now called neuroblastic rosettes. Neuroblastic. Which tells us right away that they're made of cells that look like developing nerve cells. Makes sense. More informative, right? Yeah, for sure. And less like a history lesson. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So the paper also mentioned different types of rosettes based on what's in their center. Yes, different types. What's that all about? So imagine this. Okay. A rosette has a central core, and what fills that core helps us classify it. Ah. Some rosettes, like those neuroblastic ones we talked about, yeah. have a core packed with neuronal processes. Neuronal processes? Those long arm-like extensions of nerve cells. Love it. Think of it like a, a like a tangled mess of wires. Okay. But at a microscopic level. Whoa. Then you've got retinal rosettes. Retinal rosettes. With a hollow core uh -huh. containing bits of photoreceptor structure. So like a primitive retina trying to form. Yeah, like a primitive retina uh -huh. trying to form. So it's almost like these tumors are trying to create tiny versions of yeah. normal structures. They are. But in like a messed up way. Yeah, it's a good way to think about it. Interesting. And then we have tubular rosettes. Tubular. The simplest kind. Okay. Just a single layer of cells forming a tube. Oh. Sometimes with the tiny little cilia lining the inside. Cilia like little hairs. Like microscopic hairs. Wow. So we've got these three main types, neuroblastic, retinal, and tubular. And it's amazing to me that all of this yeah. stems from this one layer in the developing embryo. The ectoderm. The ectoderm. Yeah, it's amazing. That our complex nervous system comes from that. It really is. That's wild. And not only the nervous system, oh. but the ectoderm also gives rise to other cell types. Like what? Like skin pigment cells. Oh, wow. And even cells in the adrenal gland. Oh. And this is why sometimes you yeah. even find rosettes in tumors outside the nervous system. Really? Yeah, it's wild, isn't it? That is wild. I never would have guessed that. It just goes to show you how interconnected everything is. It really does. So are you ready to get down to the nitty gritty? Let's do it. Of each rosette type? Yeah and the tumors they point towards. Okay, let's start with those neuroblastic rosettes. Right. They're the ones with the tightly hacked cells mm -hmm. and that dense tangle of neuronal processes yeah. in the center. That's right. Like we talked about. Exactly. And they're often found in... Well, you often find them in the... Aggressive. Aggressive. Embryonal tumors. Embryonal tumors. Yeah. Like medulloblastomas. 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 And some retinoblastomas. You got it. So basically the cells in these tumors... Yeah. They haven't matured properly. Right. Like they're stuck in this. They're stuck. Primitive. Embryonic state. It's like they're trying to form a brain. Okay. But just can't quite get it right. And figure 2A shows a really good example of this. Yeah. You can really see those packed cells uh -huh. and that jumbled core of neuronal processes. Now the paper also mentioned something really fascinating about these rosettes and how they might actually form. Oh, yeah. Something about the way... The way developing neurons connect. Yes. Exactly. During development. The idea is that these rosettes might be mimicking how neurons normally extend their processes no and connect during development. Uh, no. But in these tumors, yeah. the process goes awry. And that leads to these rosette formations. 
That's the thing. Wow, it's like they're following the blueprint. They are. But just missing. Like missing some steps. Some crucial steps. Yeah, a few crucial steps. And then on top of that, we can use these special stains. IHC markers. IHC markers. Yeah. To confirm the diagnosis. Right. Like synaptophysin. Synaptophysin. And neurofilament. Yes. These markers can help us identify neuronal proteins within the rosettes. So we've got the visual clue with the rosette structure. Right. And then the IHC markers give us that confirmation at a molecular level. Yeah, it's like having multiple pieces of evidence okay. pointing to the same conclusion. All right, let's move on to retinal rosettes. Okay, retinal rosettes. These are the ones with the hollow core yes. and bits of photoreceptor structures. Right, those cells that detect light in the retina. Exactly, and you can see this really clearly in figure 2B. Oh, yeah. They almost look like tiny primitive retinas. Tiny primitive retinas? Yeah. And these rosettes are often found in tumors that show retinal differentiation. Exactly. So think retinoblastoma. Oh. Reduloepitheliomas. Reduloepitheliomas. And sometimes even olfactory neuroblastomas. Wow. Yeah. The paper also mentioned florets. Florets. Which sound like uh, a less organized version of retinal rosettes. That's a good way to put it. Are they equally important for diagnosis? Well, they are. Okay. They can be tricky to spot. How so? Because they're less defined than the classic retinal rosettes. I see. Figure 2C shows a good example. Okay. It looks more like clusters of retinal cells okay. than a clearly defined rosette. So we might be missing them more often than we realize? It's possible, yeah, because of the difficulty in identifying them. What about IHC markers for these retinal features? You mean for florets? Yeah. Can they be used to confirm the diagnosis? Well, they can be used. Okay. But there's still debate about how reliable they are. Oh, really? In definitively diagnosing tumors with florets. So more research is needed. More research is definitely needed. On that. To refine our understanding. Of how to interpret these markers in this context. So it sounds like there's still a lot to learn about florets. Oh, absolutely. And their diagnostic significance. Yeah. And that's what makes this field so exciting. For sure. There's always something new to discover. Always something new. Yeah. All right, so we've covered neuroblastic rosettes and retinal rosettes. Yeah, those were fascinating. So now let's move on to... Tubular rosettes. Tubular rosettes. The third member of the rosette trio. Exactly. And if I remember correctly, you mentioned these are the simplest in structure. They are the simplest. That's a single layer of cells yeah. forming a tube. Uh -huh. So what kinds of tumors are these tubular rosettes usually associated with? Well, you usually find them. Yeah. In ependymomas, ependymomas, these tumors arise from the lining of the ventricles. Oh, okay. Those fluid-filled spaces in the brain. And what's really interesting... What's really interesting is yeah. that these tubular rosettes uh -huh. sometimes even form larger structures called ependymal canals. Ependymal canals. Which actually mimic the structure of the ventricles. So like the, the tumor cells yeah. are trying to build their own little ventricle system. It's a good way to think about it. That's kind of eerie but amazing. It is pretty amazing. And figures 2D, 2E, and 2F show this beautifully. They do. They show the range of appearances these tubular rosettes can have. Yeah, from small, simple tubes yeah. to these larger, more complex, canal-like structures. Now, the paper did mention that diagnosing these tubular rosettes can be tricky. Oh, it can be. Why is that? Well, they can be easily mistaken okay. for structures that are found in glandular tumors. Glandular tumors. Yeah. And figures 2 a guy through 2i show some examples of these lookalikes. Oh, wow. They do look similar. They do. So just looking at the structure itself might not always be enough. No, it's not always enough. To make a definitive diagnosis. It's not. Yeah. That's where those IHC markers come in handy. Okay. They can help us differentiate between a true tubular rosette and those glandular imposters. And are there specific markers? Well, for example, yeah. ependymomas typically stain positive for markers like GFA, GFA. and pansy-taw keratin, AE13. Okay. While glandular tumors yeah. might express different markers. So it's another case of needing all the puzzle pieces. Yeah, you need all those puzzle pieces. To get the full picture. To see the whole picture. Now, you mentioned that tubular rosettes are mainly found in ependymomas. Right, mainly in ependymomas. But they can also show up in other types of brain tumors, right? They can. Like what? Well, they've been reported in a few cases of canine central nervous system 
embryonal tumors, okay. bovine cerebellar medulloblastomas, huh. and even a canine olfactory neuroepithelioma. So even though these structures have a typical location, mm -hmm. they can sometimes surprise us. They can. By appearing in unexpected places. Absolutely. It's like they're breaking the rules. Yeah, they're rule breakers. Okay, so we've explored the three main types of rosettes. Neuroblastic, retinal, and tubular. The big three. Now, what about those pseudorosettes? Ah, pseudorosettes. What makes them different? So the key difference mm -hmm. is what they form around. What do you mean? True rosettes, remember. They have yeah. a central core right. filled with cell processes mm -hmm. or a lumen. Okay. Pseudorosettes, though, yeah. organize themselves around a blood vessel. A blood vessel. Yes, you can see this really well in figure three. Okay. It shows this distinct feature of pseudorosettes. So instead of a core... Instead of a core. They have a blood vessel yeah. at their center. They do. Interesting. Does this difference in structure tell us anything about the types of tumors they're found in? Well, pseudorosettes tend to be less specific to a particular tumor type okay. than true rosettes are. So we see them in a wider range of tumors. Yes, a wider range. Uh -huh. Well, we see them in embryonal tumors like medulloblastomas, huh. ependymomas. Ependymomas again? But also in non-embryonal tumors. Okay. Like meningiomas. So they're less like a specific fingerprint. Less like a fingerprint. And more like a general clue. Yeah, more like a general clue. But they can still be helpful. They can still be helpful. In guiding our diagnosis. For sure. But we need to consider them in context with all the other information we have about the tumor. Right. It's all about the big picture. And the paper mentioned finding pseudorosets in a really surprising variety of tumors. Oh, yeah. Everything from pineal tumors to peripheral neuroblastomas to even a paraganglioma. Quite a list, isn't it? It is. It's quite a diverse list. It really highlights the fact yeah. that while pseudorosets might not point us toward a specific diagnosis, okay. they are valuable indicators that ah. can help us narrow down the possibilities. And prompt further investigation. Exactly. I also noticed that the terminology used to describe these structures mm -hmm. can vary. Yeah, it can. Depending on the tumor type. Right. For example, in human meningiomas, yeah. they're often called pseudoreset like patterns. That's right. So even within this seemingly well-defined world yeah, of right. microscopic structures. Of microscopic structures. There are a lot of nuance. There is. And variability. You gotta, it's not always about fitting things into neat categories. I see. It's more about understanding the spectrum of what we might see under the microscope. Okay, this makes me wonder how consistent the reporting of these rosettes actually is. Mm, that's a good question. If there's so much nuance and variability, yeah. are we even capturing the full picture of their prevalence and significance? That's the crux of the matter, and it's something the paper addresses directly. Okay. It points out that much of what we know yeah. about rosettes and pseudorosettes uh -huh. comes from studies on canine and feline tumors. Okay. So we have a significant knowledge gap yeah. when it comes to their occurrence and meaning in other species. So what we know about rosettes in a dog... Right might not necessarily apply to a horse a horse or a bird or a bird for instance exactly and it's limited understanding yeah goes beyond just species differences it does we also need more research we do to clarify the specific types of rosettes mm -hmm. found in different parts of the nervous system yeah different locations different subtypes and their connection to various tumor subtypes that's a big research area sounds like we're really just starting to scratch the surface here yeah of understanding these rosettes and pseudorosettes. We need a much broader perspective. We do. We really grasp their diagnostic potential. Yeah, across different species. Different species. And tumor types. And tumor types. Imagine. Imagine a comprehensive atlas of rosettes. Oh, wow. Mapping out their variations across different animals. Yeah. And tumor locations. That would be amazing. It would be incredibly valuable. It would. For both research and clinical practice. Like a Rosetta Stone. Yeah, like a Rosetta Stone. For veterinary neuropathology. Exactly. Helping us decode the meaning of these microscopic structures. In different contexts, yeah. The paper also emphasizes it does. The need for more standardized IHC profiles. Yes, standardized IHC profiles are important. For these tumors. Especially for those rare embryonal neoplasms. And why is that? Well, it seems like there's a lot of variability okay. in the reported staining patterns. I see. Which makes it difficult yeah. to draw clear conclusions. So we need a more consistent approach to IHC. We do. To really unlock its full diagnostic power. Absolutely. Using a standardized panel of markers okay. and having clear 
interpretation criteria yeah. would make research findings more reliable right. and ultimately lead to more accurate diagnoses. It's amazing to think how much information we can get. I know, it's incredible. From these tiny structures. Tiny structures. That most people will never even know exist. It's like we've been on a journey. A journey. Through a hidden world. A hidden yeah, world. Hidden in the brain. It really has been a fascinating journey. It has. And it's clear that we still have much to explore. Oh, so much to explore. This field is full of potential. It's absolutely. For both diagnostic and scientific advancement. It's a call for careful observation. Yeah. Rigorous research uh -huh. and a willingness to embrace the complexities we encounter. Well, on that note. Yeah. I think it's time to leave our listeners okay. with a final question to ponder. A question to ponder. Something to spark their curiosity. All right. Fire up those neurons. Considering the incredible diversity of cell types that arise from the ectoderm. The ectoderm. That single layer of cells. Yeah. Responsible for so much of our nervous system. It's amazing, isn't it? It is. Where else might we find these intriguing rosettes? Where else indeed? And what secrets might they reveal? <sighs> the secrets they hold. About those tumors. From Vet Neurojar, keep those minds-inspired hearts light and tails wagging.